I got to meet this afternoon and spend a little time with her. And uh, she lives not too far from where I used to live in the Atlanta area. And we have one thing in common. We both love sobriety. And it was great spending some time with her and, and uh, listening to what she had to say. And you know what? They get sober in the Atlanta area just like they do in the Palm Beach area. My name is Mike and I am an alcoholic. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Joyce P. from Blue Ridge, Georgia. You're on. Kill, kill him. He told me to kill you. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. My name's Joyce. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Um, thank you, Fritz. Thank you, Glenn, for getting me here. I found out I was doing this um, at 3 o'clock Wednesday afternoon. Um, when things come together and the doors fly open, you know you're doing what God wants you to do. That's why I'm here. I have two things that I read. One before to remind me what I'm doing here. One after... So if you don't get something from this, there's a part in the big book that, for me, describes the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I can't stand loud, squeaky noises, Glenn, so I'm just so you know. <laughs> okay. And he just cut that CD off. All right, then. Um, okay, this is in the 12 and 12, and I'll tell you, like my sponsor told me, it's in the 12 and 12. So there you go. Find it. Lord, make me a channel of thy peace, that where there is hatred, I may bring love, that where there is wrong, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness, that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, that where there is error, I may bring truth, that where there is doubt, I may bring faith, that where there is despair, I may bring hope, that where there are shadows, I may bring light, that where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by forgetting, self-forgetting, that one finds. It is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen. You know, it was funny when, he, um, when Mike was talking about all the things and the welcome everybody and everybody's quiet and we've got speakers and we got 50 meetings, nothing. We got ice cream. <laughs> Set this place on fire. Like, yeah. And I understand Mike is doing a meditation at 10 tonight. And... Uh, I've been told that, you know, we need to be out of here by 9.45 so you can get to that. So settle in. I'm here to talk. Um, okay, all the smokers just went, oh, my God, I can't go that long. <laughs> She's talking about an hour and a half. I can't do it. Don't worry. I'm a smoker. We'll be hightailing it out of here. <laughs> and I'm also well aware that the mind can't take in more than the butt can endure. So... It won't take us that long to get sober. I've had a wonderful time here so far, absolutely wonderful. I thank y'all, truly I thank you from the bottom of my heart for this opportunity to share what the God of my understanding through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has done in my life. It is amazing. I have met a newcomer tonight. And I'm hesitant to say her name because I don't want to embarrass her or send her running. But I told her before this, I see you, baby. This is for you, Amber. It's for you. I hope you hear something that makes you want to grab onto this thing and hang on to this thing. And Mike's got 29 years. I hope you hear something that makes you want to get 30. <laughs> you know? There's different things that happen in sobriety. Different things that happen at different times in sobriety. And I'll share some of that with you if that's what God leads me to do. One thing I do every time I share my story 
is I hit my knees. I asked the God of my understanding to allow me to be a channel for him that his message flows through me and not my message. So, if you don't like it, talk to God. (laughs) (laughs) Call your sponsor. And don't let it keep you from coming to hear Lorna tomorrow night because I'm excited about that. So We'll all hang around for that one. Um, As Mike said, I... And basically, from the Atlanta area, I did grow up in South Atlanta in East Point, Georgia. And today I live in Blue Ridge, which is in the North Georgia mountains. It's right on the line of Tennessee, North Carolina, Georgia. It is absolutely beautiful. When I moved up there 12 years ago, we're like trying, we're building our house. We're trying to get papers signed and all this stuff. You got to go from Atlanta to the mountains to take this one piece of paper to this other person because they don't take it over there themselves. And I'm like, well, can't you just fax it? Uh, Well, we could. And everybody, I thought everybody up there's name was Amanda. Every place you called. Phone company, this Amanda. Power company, this Amanda. I was like, oh, my God, they're all named Amanda. They're all related. This is Alabama. Oh, my God, I'm sorry if you're from Alabama. Um... But the way of life in the mountains for me today, when I went from that 100 miles an hour of Atlanta to truly slowing down in the mountains, there's nothing like it. I can run into you today, and I've got time to talk to you. I'm not in that big of a hurry to get someplace else. I was um, raised in a, I guess, middle-class family. If we weren't, If we were poor, I don't know it. If we were rich, I don't know it. I never needed anything. I wanted a lot, Um, but I never needed anything. My father was a mechanic, and he was also a um, ordained Baptist minister. And he ran the motor pool at Fort McPherson for 32 years. He could fix anything. He was my hero. I loved my daddy. I am a daddy's girl to my core. I miss him very much. Uh, My mother was a housewife until we were all old enough that they could leave us, they thought, you know. Um, And then she went to work. I have two sisters. I have one older and one younger. And for most of my life, I heard, why can't you be like Cindy, my older sister? Nobody wants to be like Cindy, trust me. You know? (laughs) They don't want to be her. And telling me, you know, you set a bad example for your little sister. My little sister says, all you do is show me what I don't need to get caught doing. (laughs) Okay, then. There we go. She bought her car when she was 15 because she'd seen the keys taken away to mine every other week, you know. So she just bought her own car before she was even old enough to drive it. There you go. She's not an alcoholic. Neither is my older sister. No one in my family is an alcoholic. From this family. I was raised by this family. I was adopted when I was 18 months old. I had the, um, at the time I met her, the honor of meeting my natural mother and two half-brothers and a half-sister 20 years ago. I'm grateful I was sober. Um, It was beautiful for a little while. It all went south pretty quick. Um, This was uh, something I had always longed to have. I'm still grateful that I've done it. I know that I can look like a pear if I'm not real careful as the years go by, so I'm very careful about what I eat. Um, You know, if you don't learn anything else, you know, learn that. So, and yes, you really do. Just wake up fat one day. I used to look at people and think, don't you see that coming? No. You know, and people would tell me, I look in the mirror, I see my mother. Look in the mirror and find your uncle. Hello, why do you think that feels? You know, that's scary. My early, early childhood, very happy. I was a very happy little kid. I was a tomboy. I had a great time. I had a little Western auto tractor and a dancing doll. I was happy. She and I rode all over the neighborhood robbing the mailman. We had a lot of fun. The little boy next door and I were going to get married till we found out we had to take a bath. We didn't do that. <laughs> He and I used to eat the sulfur off of matches. Yes, I just said that on a CD, but we did, 
You know, I, I just had fun. I was a fun kid. I had a great time. About the time I turned 13, the only way I know today is that my mother went through menopause. It flipped her. Our home became a violent, violent place to live. She beat the hell out of me on a regular basis. Let me say this to you. If you're beating your kids, stop. If you're screaming at them and you think they're going to hear you, they don't. The louder my mother yelled, the less I heard. You know, all I prayed was not to die. Just don't let me die. No, I didn't die. But it left me with a lot of stuff to deal with. Thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous that gives us a way to deal with those things. I had a next-door neighbor that I loved dearly. The first time I met her, I was 10 years old. I'm standing there with my hands behind my back asking permission to ride my mini bike in her front yard. And I was always on a mission, mostly to save this little girl in the sixth grade, and that's a whole other story. But anyway, I was on a mission on my mini bike at 10 years old. And she gave me a safe place to run to at 15 and 16 and 17 years old. I made a path literally through those bushes to her house. It was a safe place for me to go and a fun place, some place where people laughed, you know, and enjoyed living. And we had a good time. I had my first beer at her house. What I found when I actually got kicked out of Headland High School in East Point for drugs. I'd never done drugs, and I understand we're in AA, and I'm all about singleness of purpose. So don't get me wrong on that one, but we do what we do. Anyway, I took these pills this girl told me to take, and I passed out, and they kicked me out of Headland High School, sent me to College Park High School, where they said there's no drugs. <laughs> wrong. There's a whole lot of drugs at College Park High School. And I got into them. And then I'm like 16, and I'm driving now, so, you know, I'm on wheels doing this stuff, you know. So we know that's fun, and it was a convertible, so I'm having a blast. I'm eating fried chicken, throwing it in the air. I'm just, you can't hide redneck, let me tell you. You can't hide it. I'm just, phew, phew cruising this girl says that there's a bar we can get in we're 16 i've never been out of east point it's the size of this room okay <laughs> i've never been out of there we can all get in this bar okay we go to this bar boys on the left girls on the right something very very different in the middle on a stage some of the tallest women i have ever seen in my life <laughs> Before I found Alcoholics Anonymous, that's where I found home. I found a place where I fit. And I did fit. I, at the time, I could drink till about 10 o'clock at night. We go home. I'm home by midnight. Everything's good. That didn't last very long. Um, I can remember going in my mother's house. And, you know, when you pull in your parents' house, and some of y'all that are here from the treatment center, God bless you, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. But when you're sneaking in your mama's house, you know, and you cut the motor off and you cruise into the garage, and, you know, you're parking right by their bedroom window, but you just know they don't hear you, you know. They're parents. Hello. They hear you. They can hear you if you're down here, you know. I'm in the house. I'm trying to shut the door. I finally get that thing to latch. I turn around, my mother flips the light on. She's been sitting there on the couch for half an hour watching me try to get in the freaking house. <laughs> you know, and she's looking at me, she's like, let me smell your breath. Okay, I can barely see you, and you want me to breathe in your face? You know, and what's wrong with your eyes? I'm tired. And, you know, I loved being in the middle of a conversation with my mother, and then just Nothing. I got no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> Why I'm even talking to her. You know, go to Kroger or Ingalls or whatever you got. Paranoid as hell at 3 o'clock in the morning because you know that only people like us are buying chocolate covered graham crackers and laced potato chips at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Normal people don't do that. But it gave me an out. When I found alcohol, it gave me an out. I didn't hear that voice in my head saying I was never going to amount to anything. I didn't hear that preacher voice saying, not my daddy, but other preachers saying, you're never going to make this. Everybody in this building's going to heaven but you. You're not going. You're not going because of what you thought about, much less what you did. 
You know, well, when they tell us that stuff, they'll us that stuff. We are out of here. You know, if we're going to hell, we're going to having a dang good time, you know. And I just set off to have a real good time, and I did. I had a lot of fun. I truly believe at 16 years old, alcohol saved my life. I don't think I could have made it with all that was in my head and all that needed to apparently change about me had I not found alcohol. It made me bulletproof. I was sexy as hell. I was a damn good lover. I was, and I'm just saying all kinds of little four-letter words up here at this podium. Um, it made me comfortable in my own skin. You know? I'd never heard that phrase till I got here. I get it. But I had that then. Alcohol made me comfortable. I could talk to you. I could manipulate you. You know? Because at that point in my life, it didn't matter who you were. Somebody's going to love me. Somebody, I don't care if it's your wife, your husband, I don't care who it is, but somebody is going to love me tonight. And that's the way I went out. But if, I, if nobody loved me, then I was in a rage. And if you slept with me, you must have loved me. You know, we get here real confused about a lot of things. Sex, security, and society is for real. It's very real. Stay here long enough to get sober. Stay here long enough to find out what it's like. To not have to worry about what other people think about you anymore. As Billy B. taught me, you don't have to explain yourself anymore unless you want to. You don't have to do that. I didn't know I didn't have to do that. I didn't know I could tell you the truth. Telling the truth was harder for me to do than not drinking. I'd never told the truth. If I told you the truth, you wouldn't want to be around me. It had to be interesting or you wouldn't want to hear it. No matter what happened, it had to be extravagant. The humor in these rooms is what kept me coming back to these rooms. But early on in sobriety, I can remember going to a speaker meeting. Everybody's laughing. The speaker's up there. They're just joking around, having a good time. I'm like, I did not come here for a comedy show. I came here to hear about being sober. You know, like, I came here for my death wish. <laughs> we are not a glum lot, folks. That's in your book, too, if you don't know that. It's in there. You will not be boring, stupid, or glum. We were boring, stupid, and glum. I was. I was no real fun to be around until I got sober. My opinion was your opinion. However you felt about it, I felt about it. Anybody knows me today knows that ain't true. <laughs> you ask me, I'll tell you. Here's how I feel. And then they're going, well, my God, why well, shouldn't ask me? If you don't want to know, don't ask me because I'll tell you. And if I walk away from you, it's probably best. We don't hit people anymore. My sponsor taught me that. We do not hit people in sobriety. <laughs> you learn some of the easiest things just coming in these rooms. You don't hit people. And as this girl casually said in a meeting Wednesday, she said, you know, I used to take things from people and stores. <laughs> Only in these rooms can you say that so casually without somebody <laughs> gasping for air that, oh my God, <laughs> you stole something. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, and I might not be that sober today, so be careful, you know. But I found my out with alcohol. I found it. And it quickly and it also says in the book that it takes women faster. It'll take us down quick. And it did. It did. Eighteen years old, I'd wiped out my second, third car. My daddy's a mechanic. He could rebuild them, fix them up. Here we go. Another reason my mother hated me because, you know, my daddy adored me because I was his. He'd fix me up another car. Off I go. Trashed it. And what's amazing to me, and the Al-Anons will get this, I know, and I love Al-Anon, and I highly recommend marrying one. God, I do. Um, people believe what we tell them. Is it not weird that people just look at our outrageous, been taken by an alien stories, and they believe it? You know, I drove home one day to my parents' house, right before I got sober. Half of my car was literally gone. 
My mother's like, what happened to your car? I don't know. <laughs> What's wrong with it? And she's taking me out there to look at it as if, you know, I really don't know. <laughs> and I have to admit that I only have a vague memory of what really did happen to it. You know, it's like waking up with all those phone numbers that are long distance things. You know, I don't know who those people are. I'm not calling them. I don't want to talk to them. I'm not answering anything that's not right here. I'm not calling. And at that time, they didn't have caller ID, so you don't know who it is anyway. Insane things happen. I can remember one time a friend of mine and I stole a bottle of Tangeray gin from her dad's basement. He had just walls of liquor. I was a beer drinker. I remember my grandmother telling me my cousin was going to be fine because he didn't drink out. He didn't drink liquor anymore. He was just drinking beer. Okay, he'll be fine. Let's go on with that. But we stole this bottle of Tangeray gin. I woke up on the back seat of a Trailways bus headed to Panama City Beach, Florida with a one-way ticket in my hand and some picture in a golden frame of some beautiful boy. I don't know who this man is. <laughs> but he loved me enough that night to put me on a bus. <laughs> and send me off with a picture from his mother's mantle of him. I couldn't tell you today who that guy is. I don't know. When I was a little, when I was like 14, 15, I was in Fulton County Juvenile for running away, hello, and being unmanageable, unruly and unmanageable. So I'm in juvenile. Spent my 15th birthday in juvenile. Spent some time at the Salvation Army Girls Lodge. Met this girl. We meet these two little boys. We're going to run away at, I think we were 14. We were leaving. We were going to Mardi Gras. And lived happily after, after, ever after with these two boys, that, you know, because we loved them. <laughs> you know? So we ran away from there. I spent the afternoon with the outlaw bikers in Atlanta. I'm knocking on doors. Can I stay with you? No. This one guy says, no, but these people probably let you. It was the outlaw bikers. First time I'd ever smoked a joint, only because I was terrified not to. I'd never seen anything like this. <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, what the hell? You know, I don't know what I'm doing. I was really kind of glad to go to that bar later on to find out I didn't have to deal with all that crap. I could just go to the bar and be me. But, you know, it was crazy stuff, crazy kind of stuff. I didn't think about not drinking. Drinking made sense. But I go at 18 to see my juvenile probation officer. She says, Joyce, you're an alcoholic. Uh, no, alcoholics are men. Homeless men. <laughs> Old homeless men. <laughs> Not cute little girls in their security guard uniform. Not me. I'm not an alcoholic. There is no way. That is not possible. She starts naming off all these things. Then she gives me that question thing, you know, where you check those things off. That just pissed me off. I threw that thing away. <laughs> I figured it didn't apply to me. It was some kind of trick, you know. I've been tricked all my life. I'm a victim at this point, you know, of all these people and all their crap. So anyway, I finally gave in. I go over to Fulton County Detox. The lady looks up to me and she says, are you here for alcoholism? No, I'm here to check the water lines. Hello, yes. <laughs> what else would I be doing in this place? So she says, go sit around the corner. So I go sit down. There's this guy there, an alcoholic. He's talking to me, telling me his name over and over and over and over and over and over and over asking me my name, and I'm thinking, okay, I am seriously not an alcoholic. This is. Then this counselor comes around the corner. Looks like Sally Struthers used to look. I might be an alcoholic. I might be. I can handle this. I'll go to a little, few little uh, Sally Struthers meetings. I'll be all right. I got a plan. So I'm going through the whole gay thing with her, trying to figure out if I'm going to hell or not, you know, if I need to quit drinking or if I'm an alcoholic or what. Let me tell you what this woman did. And always, for some reason, God leads me to say this every freaking time and you can't see it. But you guys can see it. She says, look at your fingernails. Okay. She said, you're fine. I said, what do you mean? She said, guys look at their fingernails like this. Women look at their fingernails like that. I'm like, great, we figured out I'm female. Now what? Am I going to hell or not? You know, I don't know what's going on. I'm drinking. I ain't got time for this stuff. Y'all getting too close to the real deal. I'm getting drunk. 
And I did. I did not get sober until I was 24 years old, and this disease damn near killed me. In a real short time, I ended up in places I never dreamed I'd end up in. Woke up in places I still don't know how I got there. You know, I have scars on my hands that I don't even know how I got there. I don't know how I hurt myself. I don't know what happened. I don't know how my car got wrecked over and over again. I don't know. You know, and you wake up with that, just those little pieces of what happened. That's worse than knowing. When you got just little bleeps of the night before. Let me tell you guys that are new, you don't ever have to feel that again. Never do you have to wake up not knowing where you are again. You do not have to drink again. There is a change. There is a way to do this. There is a way to get sober and stay sober. We do have a solution in this program. I'll tell you this. If you're still smoking pot, you ain't sober. Hear it. It means sound mind. You ain't out buying graham crackers and laced potato chips at 3 o'clock in the morning because you got a sound mind. That ain't sobriety, folks. I'll tell you this, too. If anybody's telling you that that medication that you take means you're not sober, you find somebody else to talk to. If that's not your doctor, they got no right. Don't take chances on people's lives, people. You know, let me tell you, if I didn't take the medications that have been prescribed for me, I'd be one depressed, hormonal, having a grandma seizure bitch up here right now. Take your medication. If your doctor prescribes it to you, you take it the way it's prescribed. Don't let nobody tell you that. It's not your doctor. And if it's your sponsor, but i got to get you another sponsor because that ain't sponsorship. Somebody telling you what step you're on ain't sponsorship. You tell yourself what step you're on. Work them at your pace, not somebody else's pace. You know, if I start taking credit for your sobriety, i got to take credit when you go out there and get drunk. I ain't going there. I'm not doing it. At 24 years old, I ended up on that Trailways bus headed for Florida. The girl that was on the bus was the one that I had run away from the Salvation Army Girls Lodge with. She looks at me. She says, your name, Joyce? Yeah. She reminds me of who she is. You know, this is years later. And she said, I'm going home to my folks' house. Spend the night with us. Okay. What do I know? I'm going, I got a picture of a boy in my hand. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> so we go in. We get off this bus at an old gas station in Weewahitchka, Florida. It's really half the size of this room. And they lived on a pig farm. I love pork chops. I don't particularly like them in that direction. <laughs> I've never seen anything so disgusting in my life. It was enough to make me want to eat what Glenn eats, you know, graze. I was like, oh, my God. I spend the night here. I pray for God to send me somebody safe. I'm hitchhiking. Send me somebody safe. This old van pulls over. This guy opens the door, and I'm like, oh, my God. It's a Baptist preacher. Baptized me all the way to Panama City Beach. <laughs> Going to save my soul. See, I said that like I was raised in a Baptist church, didn't I? I can do it. Um, I can scare you right out that door with that Baptist stuff, let me tell you. If you're Baptist, yay you, okay? Um, I don't carry that around no more. But I ended up, Panama City Rescue Mission sent me back home. One year sober, I finally earned a vacation. I came back down to Panama City. I went to that rescue mission to pay them back for the trip they gave me home. They said, we don't have a form for that. Nobody's ever come back to pay us back before. <laughs> okay, it's a donation, okay? My life started changing, you know? The last night that I drank, I went to the same friend's house, the same lady, that I'd had my first beer. I had my last drink. I went to her house. She did what she always does. Comes home from work, has her glass of wine. If I could do that and not get naked, I'd be all right. <laughs> It doesn't happen like that for me. I get drunk, I get naked. 
but she can have it. And she looks at me and she said, you know, I'd offer you one, but I don't want to mess up what you're doing. And, you know, and I'm like, it's okay, I'm in AA. And that's my understanding of AA. Because that very first meeting I went to, they gave me this big book. They gave me my 12 and 12. I went home. I'm reading this book. I'm opening a Schlitz. That's how long ago that was. Some people in here going, what the hell's a Schlitz? It's a beer. <laughs> and I'm trying to find out how to do this. If somewhere in here has got to tell me how I can drink, not get naked, not worry about going to hell. I mean, I used to come home drunk. You can actually Google this. I used to come home drunk. Call Baptist preachers in the middle of the night to ask them if I was going to hell. <laughs> they say yes. I call the radio station. They play sad songs for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to hell. You know, nobody loves me. That's how I lived. You know, it was crazy. I think it saved my life. But at the same time, it damn near killed me by the time it was over. You know, first meeting when I'm 18, I'm home drinking a beer, reading this big book. This big book. It's duct taped together now. At 24, I'm back at my friend's house. And that moment of clarity did not come. I said, it's okay, I'm in AA. I had that glass of wine. Had another one. Had an amaretto. Smoked a little bit. And I remember that night, because I'd done that controlled drinking, try that. If you don't think you're an alcoholic, go try that control stuff. Or believe me, it don't work. <laughs> it does not work. During that controlled drinking is when I lost that half of my car. So that's how well that went. But that night, I hope to God I never forget that that night, I thought, I don't want to feel this way anymore. I could no longer control what I said, control my actions. Again, I'm in people-pleasing mode. I'm going to be what you want me to be because I just want you to let me hang around. You know, I was always somebody's little buddy. I am nobody's little buddy today, and nobody's mine. I don't stand in anybody's shadow. don't want anybody standing in my shadow, you know. Conferences are a wonderful thing and they're fun to go to. People have a tendency to treat a speaker at a conference like there's something different about them. Let me tell you all something. There ain't nothing different. <coughs> spiritual speaker Sunday morning. If that was me, I ain't no more spiritual Sunday morning than I am on Friday night. Okay? That's it. And I'm as much an alcoholic and a part of this program and as a friend says, another bozo on the bus as anybody else in this room. Don't put people on pedestals. They will fall off, and they will disappoint you because you expect them to do it. And when they don't do it, then you're disappointed. You don't expect nothing. You don't get disappointed. You know, I have a faith in God today that is strong. I had faith in God when I got here. It was strong. God was out to get me, <laughs> seriously out to get me. I had a lot of things happen before I got sober. You know, 11 years old, I was raped by my uncle's uh, friend. He was 16. At 16 years old, that bar that we'd found to go to, I'd gone out to my car to get some air. A man got in, threw his hands around my throat. Drive this car, I'll kill you. I drove the car. I was raped in that car. I had nobody to go to. It wasn't like the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, where you can pick up the phone and call anybody. And the circles have wagoned, uh, circle wagons have circled just like that. In this program, we circle the wagons. You know, we're like the, the birds flying in formation. One of us falls. We all going. We're going to stand right there with you till you're ready to fly again. And then we're all going to fly. That's the way this program works. That night I decided I don't want to feel this way anymore. I went to Fulton County Detox and I picked up what I hope will be my last white chip. That was on June 7th, 1981. I think it's fabulous that so many of you showed up to help me celebrate my 31st year in sobriety. <laughs> I truly did not expect to live to be 25. 
to celebrate 31 years sober and 55 years old is a miracle for me. To be able to do like I did tonight, hit my knees, turn this over to the God of mind is standing, that didn't happen to me before I got sober. When I got here, I was scared to death. I cried most of the time at what other people said. I could not believe what people shared, what kind of honesty came out of people. I was scared to death. What if you didn't like me? And as cliche as it sounds, we've all felt it. What if you don't like me? Nobody's ever got kicked out of Alcoholics Anonymous. You can't get kicked out. You can be told to shut the hell up. (laughs) You can be told to call your sponsor. You can be told to sit down because you don't know what you're talking about. But you're not going to be thrown out of AA. It's not going to happen. This is someplace we all belong. I belong. Things happen to you in sobriety. I got sober that first year. I worked my butt off. I, but, you know, I had a topic, too. Every time they ask, you know, even though I didn't want to be known or, you know, whatever, I've got my hand up because, you know, we're still about us, even if we're scared to death. And my topic was that I did not want to be an alcoholic. Okay. Well, fine. We love you. Keep coming back. Okay. And then I finally got a topic of I told the truth. Good. People have been doing that forever. We're proud of you. We love you. Keep coming back. I didn't, wasn't real crazy about a lot of people in this program. They were like mean, you know, like you wash the ashtrays when you could smoke in a meeting. Let me tell you, there was a time you wouldn't be able to see me in this room in an AA meeting. And I'd have been up here just chaining away with the rest of them. You know, you smoke four cigarettes in an AA meeting, I promise you. Sitting in a cloud, you get to wash the ashtrays. You get to wash the coffee cups. I remember, and I had wonderful teachers in this program. I mean incredible teachers. They never said, here's what you need to do. Or if I was you, I'd do this. And here's what step you're on. And this is what you're going to do. These people lived in a way that showed me how to live. They didn't have to tell me how to live. They showed me how to live. Mary Mack, who I knew before I got sober, said to me at one point, you need to find somebody you can talk to, Joyce, because you got things in you you got to get out. And I'm not the one. Because she was like a grandmother to me. She said, I want you to be able to say whatever you need to say. She taught me about getting out of people's way and letting people find who they need to talk to. If something's not working out between you and a sponsor, maybe you're not the one. Get out of their way. Let people get sober. You know? And whatever gets you to meeting, if it's that cute boy, that cute girl, whatever gets you back to a meeting, just go to the meeting. Okay? You'll get over that in a time period when they start talking more and you go, oh, my God. You know? (laughs) You will get over it. And hopefully you'll get over it before you're looking at your hand going, oh, my God, I married him. Things do happen through sobriety. At 13 months, I'm like, what happened to my cloud? You know, because at six months, let me tell y'all, six months, I was stone cold sober. I was healing the sick and casting out demons. I could tell you, you are setting yourself up. You're fixing to get drunk. You need to do this. You got to do that. I'm on TV. It says, Joyce, alcoholic. I'm like, oh, my God, it's on my TV. Yeah, there's a reason that it says, press, radio, and film. Hello, don't go on TV and tell people you're alcoholic. That's not a real good idea. So at 13 months, I call Mary Mac. I'm like, what? I don't feel good anymore. She said, Joyce, didn't I tell you there was kind of a dropping off place after that year? No. Okay, well, I'm sorry. There's kind of a dropping off place after that. (laughs) Okay, then. Two and a half years, I figure out I'm in a cult. I have been sucked into a cult. (laughs) My sponsor's got 12 years by now. She's been fooled a lot longer than I am. I'm on the phone. I'm going, Jude, do you know that we're in a cult? (laughs) Really? God, I love sponsors. Well, they just let us just go on, you know, and exactly when did that planet land? When did that fall in your yard? You know? (laughs) Go with the aliens, baby. It'll be all right. (laughs) So I'm telling her, and so she says, So you've been brainwashed? Yes. 
She said, maybe your brain need a washing. <laughs> Click. I don't even like her anymore. <laughs> and you can not like your sponsor. It does not matter if you like your sponsor. And you can hang up on them, but if you're sitting there staring at them, waiting on you to call you back, ain't going to happen. If you had what they wanted, you'd be their sponsor. <laughs> you will call them back. Judy, my sponsor, sponsored a whole bunch of us. And we'd get together. You know, we'd team up on her. We're all going to fire her. You're going to fire somebody you didn't even hire. Okay. <coughs> and how are you going to fire a sponsor? Okay, whatever. What, you quit giving a damn? What does that mean? I don't know what that means, fire one. Anyway. We're all going to get rid of her. We're getting another sponsor. Nobody did it. She's been sponsoring all of us for decades. She'll celebrate 40 years in December, whether we do or not. You know, her life's going to rock on. I left her a message one time because I got that answer machine again. I was like, the last thing I needed was a damn answer machine. She's listening to it, laughing at me. You know? If you think your sponsor is sitting at home waiting on you to call them, wrong. If they are, get you another sponsor. <laughs> get a life. You know, if that's all you do is sponsor people, get a life. If you go to the same meetings all the time, go to different meetings where you don't know who, you know, who the pervert is, who the asshole is, who the one you're not supposed to listen to is, you know, who's the one you go get coffee when they start talking because they're all about them. Go somewhere where you don't know who these people are and you think they're wonderful, you know, and it's the one nobody else would have listened to, but you hear every word because you're open to it, you know. Seven years was a tough time in sobriety. You know, you think you got this thing. You ain't got it. Ten years in this program, I looked the hardest at me as I had in all of my sobriety. I didn't, and those people that are working, I know when you're in treatment and you got to do all that kind of stuff that they tell you to do, and do whatever you got to do to get out of there, okay, just do it. Because we'll be here. We'll be here. But people working four steps at 30 days, I couldn't read the book at 30 days, okay? I worked a four step. I had 18 months. But I truly worked this third step, truly, when I had 10 years. I'd met my natural mother. She went to my parents' house, told them if they'd better, been better Christians, I wouldn't be gay. I don't need to go to those AA meetings. All I need to do is turn my life and my will over to God. Okay. I did not drive my truck through her house. Thank you, Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I did threaten her, but I didn't do it. <laughs> Things happen. But that lady had me convinced once again that I was going to hell. And I sat there by a lake and I told God, I want to be whoever and whatever it is that you put me here to be. And if this is a part of me that is not supposed to be a part of me, then you're going to have to take it from me because I don't know how to not do that. I have never before or ever since felt what I felt that day. It was a peace that I can't explain. And I clearly heard, you're all right with me. You're all right with me. I spoke in um, Murphy, North Carolina not long ago. I walked into this church, and I swear y'all thought I was about to speak to the Southern Baptist Convention. I mean, it was that. Oh, Lord, what have I done? I mean, we're alcoholics. We ain't supposed to be looking like as much a Southern Baptist. Hello. I mean, unless you're a Southern Baptist. But, but I'll tell you something else that happened to me, and only happens in AA. I had a man with his first year ask me to give him his chip. When I'm giving him his chip, I told them, only in Alcoholics Anonymous, Kim with can someone ask, and I'd be so humbled by, be able to give their chip, an open gay woman, to a literal foot-washing Baptist? There was not more love could be had between the two of us. That's the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Don't look at what's different. Look at what you got in common. I told my story that night thinking I'm speaking to the Southern Baptist Convention and these people are not going to like me after this and I'm never going to be allowed back in North Carolina. Okay, I'm 30 years sober, and I'm thinking they're going to throw me out. <laughs> I hit my knees. I did what I do. I started to walk out of the chapel in that church, and it said, I go with you. That's all I got to know. After that meeting, a lady came up to me in tears. She said, can I talk to you? She said, I don't want to be those people that you talked about in your story. 
I don't want to hate my son. My son's in the car, and he's dealing with his sexuality, and I'm not. And I want to know if you'll talk to us. I've never experienced something more loving in my life than standing there with those two people, stepping outside of what they both truly believed to give each other a chance to listen to what somebody else had to say. You know, it's amazing what the program does. Right after my 15th anniversary in this program, I got married. As legally as I can get married in the state of Georgia, I got married. <laughs> Which is why I highly recommend marrying an Al-Anon. Until they start telling you what to do. <laughs> How to do it. And, you know, anyway. Ten years. We were married ten years. It was absolutely beautiful. I have never in my life loved someone enough to let them go. Never loved someone enough to want them to be happy more than I wanted them to be with me. That's what I wanted for Mary. She's happy. I'm happy. Seven years later, we're still friends. Very, very close friends. That was the happiest day of my life. I didn't drink. When my daddy died at the time, it was the hardest thing I'd ever been through. I'd been, I hadn't talked to my family in 10 years since I got married. I wasn't allowed to be there anymore. Barry, my daddy, was tough. His preacher wouldn't let him come see my house I built in the mountains because he'd be condoning my life so he couldn't come and see it. But the day he died, the first thought I had was, now you can see my house. Now you see it. We form relationships in this program that are unique and priceless. You know, I have had most incredible highs in this program and stayed sober. I have worked through a lot. I spent two years in the fetal position dealing with the fact that my grandfather molested all three of us as kids. You do what you got to do. If you need outside help, get it. Do what you got to do to stay sober. Don't put anybody or anything above your sobriety because ain't nothing worth it. Nothing. I was sharing with somebody earlier Talking about drinking doesn't change anything. And the man at Easy Does It group in Atlanta said one time his 16-year-old daughter told him she was pregnant. He got drunk, stayed drunk for two weeks. He said, I'll come back home, Dad. That girl wasn't still pregnant. <laughs> That's the way that goes, people. It, you don't get unpregnant. You know, it don't happen. It, you can't fix it by getting drunk. At 18 years, we built the house. And this is how cunning, baffling, and powerful alcoholism is. We don't even have the ground graded yet. And my thought is I'm sitting on that front porch that I don't even know what it looks like yet, having a glass of wine, smoking a Cuban cigar. Okay. 18 years sober, what you doing? <laughs> Think that one through, because I had met one of the neighbors up the road. You know, I know me. I'm naked. I'm at them. They're knocking on the door. <laughs> hey, you know. Like somebody's going to say, hey, come on in. <laughs> do what you got to do to stay sober. My friend Anna's here tonight, and I'm so grateful she's here. We have a, had, had a shared a love for a mutual friend. I had five other friends come up today from Fort Lauderdale. A year and a half ago, my friend Chip, who I love dearly, Chip, we... I was, he was my bubba, and I was his Laylene. And he was my husband, and I was his wife. And it was this whole little thing we did for years. And, you know, I loved him. I loved him. He got um, Briquette's lymphoma a year and a half ago. And I was at the hospital. I lived in, I lived in Blue Ridge in the mountains. He was in the hospital in Atlanta. And... It was tough. You know, Chip also had AIDS. So there's the whole dealing with his family and all the dynamics of that and things that have been said and blah, blah, blah. And resentments. If you've got deep-seated resentments, guess what physically they will turn into? Cancer. I'm at the hospital with this man that I adore. I don't know how I'm going to do this. You know, I'm standing on my porch when I get the news. There's a man who lived with me at the time. He's like a son to me. He's having a cancer benefit tomorrow. Keep Murphy in your prayers. He's got a battle ahead. 
I get to be Nana to his eight-month-old son. And I've never had a kid, so yay. <laughs> Thank you, God. I didn't have to go through that, you know. Chip got cancer. We're on the phone. He's one of the most spiritually grounded people I knew, but he had a lot of battles, a lot of battles. Glenn's got CDs of Chip. It's Chip H. I'm standing in that hospital room. His niece had never been allowed to touch him because she might catch something. And she's standing there shaking, and it's just the two of us. And I told her, you can touch him. You're not going to hurt him. And he's not going to hurt you. And he got to feel that niece's hand on his chest for the first time in his life at 46 years old. He finally got to feel that. I had to talk for him, but I had to understand from him, and Anna was with me. I called his South Florida people because he had friends in Fort Lauderdale, friends in Atlanta. Chip could not make up his mind. He liked Atlanta till it got cold. He liked Fort Lauderdale till it got too hot, so he's back and forth. Anyway, I called the Fort Lauderdale people, let them know what's going on. Within hours, they're around his bed. The people I had lunch with today and Anna were standing there around that bed with me saying goodbye to our friend. That only happens in Alcoholics Anonymous. Doesn't happen anywhere else. You know, I've got my hand on his chest and when that precious heart stopped beating, something died in me. I went to the darkest place I've ever been. So I'm telling you, if you got a lot of time, don't take it for granted. I went to a dark, dark place. Chip and I were so connected, I felt like he was trying to take me with him. And I couldn't seem to break it. I went to the South Florida Roundup last year as a gift. That beautiful home that I built in the mountains foreclosed two years ago. I lost it. My business that I'd been in for 35 years died. There's a lot of changes going on in my life when Chip died. I went to a dark, dark place. I'm driving to Miami for the South Florida Roundup last year. I'm in Macon. All of a sudden, there's something metal right in front of my car. I swerve to miss it. I'm spinning. I'm headed for the guardrail, the cement thing. I see that. I'm spinning the other way. All I hear, and all I can say is, God help me, God help me, God help me, God help me, God help me. That's all I remember saying, and I'm spinning. That car stopped. It cut off. I got it cranked. I turned around. I'm back. I stopped at the first gas station, trust me, and um, went on my way. And what it finally came to me was, that's where my life was. At 30 years sober, that's where my life was. Or at 29 years. I was spinning in the dark, and all I could say was, God, help me. He got me stopped. He got me turned around. And he got me back on this journey where I could celebrate 31 years this year. I'm going to read something to you that's in the big book. Um... I thank you again for allowing me to share my experience, strength, and hope with you. I hope you got something you needed. I know I did. There is nothing worth drinking over. Nothing. This is um, actually not in the big book itself. It's in the stories in the back. And I couldn't tell you the page anyway because you probably got a version that doesn't match mine. So there we go. And then you just have a resentment about, she said it was on page so-and-so. Read it yourself, okay? I changed one word in it to make it apply to me and my sobriety. The rest of it, I could have written this myself. The last 31 years of my life have been rich and meaningful. I have had my share of problems, heartaches, and disappointments, because that is life. But also, I have known a great deal of joy and a peace that is the handmaiden of an inner freedom. I have a wealth of friends, and with my AA friends, an unusual quality of fellowship. For to these people, I am truly related, first through mutual pain and despair, and later through mutual objectives and newfound faith and hope. And as the years go by, working together, 
sharing our experiences with one another, and also sharing a mutual trust, understanding, and love without strings, without obligation. We acquire relationships that are unique and priceless. There is no more aloneness. With that awful ache so deep in the heart of every alcoholic that nothing before could ever reach it. That ache is gone and need never return again. Now there is a sense of belonging, of being wanted and needed and loved. In return for a bottle and a hangover, we have been given the keys of the kingdom. Thank you.